I'm Steve Coburn, the Executive Director of Wharton Digital Press, and today I have with me Richard Lambert, who is the Miller Sherrod Professor of Accounting at the Wharton School and author of Finance and Accounting Essentials in the Wharton Executive Education Essentials Series. Good afternoon, Rick. Good afternoon. Uh, let me ask, start by asking you, does every manager really need to understand financial data? Don't they have staffs of finance people and accountants to handle that? Uh, they often do have staffs of finance and accounting people to handle some of it, and it's a good idea for them to communicate with the finance and staff people, but they have a different job than the finance and staff people. The job of a manager is to use the information. Uh, the job of the finance and accounting people is to produce that. And so to use it well, you have to understand what's in the numbers, what's not in the numbers, what do the words mean, uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, what's the biggest mistake that managers make when they try to use financial and accounting data? Well, I'm not sure there is a biggest mistake. I think there's actually two extremes. One is, I don't know what this is, and so I'm not going to pay any attention to it. And the other is the exact opposite, where they fixate so much on the bottom line that anything that makes the bottom line higher must be good, and anything that makes the bottom line lower must be bad and both of those are mistakes. In the book, uh, Finance and Accounting Essentials in the Wharton Executive Education Essentials series, you talk a lot about the ambiguity and subjectivity of accounting and financial data, but aren't numbers objective? How can numbers be subjective and ambiguous? Uh, numbers are objective. Uh, what the number is supposed to represent, though, is subjective. Uh, a lot of what goes on in accounting and finance is implicitly predictions about the future because we have to put together the financial statements while a lot of activities that we have begun haven't yet had all of their future consequences play out. We may have made sales, but we haven't collected them all. We may have made investments that are going to last for a long time, and so what are they going to be worth later? Uh, we may have estimates for what pension expenses are going to be, all those kinds of things. So almost every number in a financial statement is actually based on somebody's estimate of what things are going to be in the future. And that leads to ambiguity and subjectivity. That leads to ambiguity and subjectivity because nobody has a crystal ball that knows what the future is going to be. So it's your best guess. Also, because there's that subjectivity, it opens up the door for manipulation, too. And so that's a big part of accounting uh, and interpreting the accounting numbers. In your book, you talk a lot about benchmarks. What do you mean by benchmarks? And can you give us some examples? So a benchmark is something to compare a number to. So if profits were $50, is that good? Well, is it good compared to what? So one benchmark might be compared to how much you invested to make the $50. Another benchmark might be what did you make last year so that we could look for improvement and those kinds of things. And a third benchmark would be what are other divisions or what are competitors doing? Uh, all of those are good to help gauge is your performance really good or, or not. In your book, you caution managers against using numbers developed for external reports, for example, stockholder statements to actually run the business. Why wouldn't I want to do that? Aren't those good solid numbers? Well, there's really two reasons. One is the level of aggregation. The numbers that are reported to the stockholders are for the firm as a whole. And really, to be a good manager, you need to know how the parts of the firm are working. It could be a good year for the firm, but that doesn't mean that every part of the firm did well. And so you want to know where do we did well, where we didn't do well, so that we can go in and make revisions and change our strategy and try to divest this and invest more in this and those kinds of things. But the other reason is that the rules that you're required to use to put together the financial statements to send to shareholders often aren't really the best gauge of how your business is doing. And a good example is that, of that is that there are many things that are investments from an economic perspective that get expensed, that they reduce your profits in the year that you do them. Uh, things like research and development or investment in training or those kinds of things. And so doing those are, is good for the company, but they will actually make your profits lower in the year that you do them. And so you don't want to just focus solely on that number to make good long-term decisions. 
One of the other interesting things in your book, Finance and Accounting Essentials, in the Wharton Executive Education Essential Series, uh, is you argue that managers really need to get into the footnotes of financial statements. Those seem dense and difficult. Why do uh, it? The footnotes are dense and, and uh, difficult, uh, and, and that's actually why they're valuable. The footnotes tell you how the numbers were calculated. So if you see the profits are $50, it's important to know how that $50 was calculated because it could be good, it, it might not be good. Uh, how aggressive, how conservative the accounting methods were to be used to calculate that $50 number will be explained in the footnotes. And so it's a really good source of information to figure out what the numbers really mean. Rick, let me ask you why you wrote the book. Well, we wanted to reach a broader audience than we teach with our usual communication mechanisms, teaching in the MBA program and teaching executive education classes. Um, we wanted to write a book that was readable, we wanted to write a book that was relevant to managers, and we wanted to write a book that used a lot of real world examples so that you could see how to apply the information that the accounting and the finance people provide to you. Rick, what can managers do to make sure they stay on top of costs? I think of the problems that the automobile companies had, GM in particular with healthcare. Is there a way that managers can look forward, can stay on top of costs and not be surprised? Well, there are, I think, a couple of ways. One is to make sure you know what the costs are. And so having reports available that indicate that what your costs are, what the breakdown of the costs are, uh, is an important thing. Another thing is to recognize that not all costs are incurred in the form of cash right now. And healthcare and pension benefits are a good example of that. Many of them represent cash outlays that you're not going to pay into the future. And so if you're running your business on a cash basis, you might not count those because they're not being checks written today for them. Nevertheless, you have to be aware that you've got incurred the obligation to pay this in the future and uh, take those into consideration in making your operating decisions. Richard Lambert, thank you very much for, for being with us today. Thanks for having me.